So this is what the typical bird box looks like, and as you can see, they're numbered. The numbers allow us to keep track of which boxes are getting used each season. One side of the bird box flips all the way open so we can see its contents. Here we can see an abundance of nesting material, probably from a mammal. Balin is using a spray bottle in this photo to safely remove pest colonies from our bird boxes. Typically this project does not involve handling the birds, but rather just observing and recording the presence and location of the animals. Cresso staff demonstrate how to properly assemble the turtle nets. The nets sit like this underwater overnight before we collect the turtles. The turtles are placed in their own individual buckets while they're carried from the ponds to our data station. When the turtles arrive, the students work together to take several measurements on each turtle. The plastron measurement, shown here, is particularly hard to do. Next, the turtles are weighed and typically returned to the water after this. However, this summer we decided to do a few extra demonstrations for the kids, like oral swabs. Over time, we got more confident and less afraid of snapping turtle mouths. This is a painted turtle being orally swabbed. Similar to the box turtle study, if a turtle is a new capture, it receives a carapacial notch for future ID. Here's a happy looking snapping turtle, and it's a species that we typically catch during the aquatic turtle project. This is the T-shaped plastron of a snapping turtle. Note the dark brown color. This snapping turtle has a much lighter plastron color, demonstrating species variation in the form of pigmentation. This is a pond slider. Note the long nails used for courting females. The vertical bars on the slider carapace are a distinguishing feature of this species. Unfortunately, they are known to fade over time. Again, color variation is seen in the pond turtle species. This vibrant yellow could indicate that this individual is younger than the first slider I showed you. This is simply the cutest slider I've ever seen. This is a painted turtle, which is the smallest of the three species we commonly catch. You saw when you're ready. Releasing a painted. Pretty eager to get back. And there he goes. We're about to release a snapping turtle. And there it goes. Maybe. Oh, he's so cute. Bye, little guy. Oh. There we go. <laughs> kind of looks like a rock. Morgan is going to demonstrate how to release two sliders. Number one, placing it back in the pond. And there it went. It's a pretty big pond. Slider two. The snake project involves lifting pre-placed cover boards to look for snakes. Snakes can then be picked up by hand or with tongs. If the snakes are small enough, we can weigh and measure them in the field. Larger snakes are transported back to Cresso inside pillowcases to be processed. The animals are always returned to the field the same day. Students demonstrate how to measure an adult-sized snake. When we process the snakes, we perform a thorough inspection of their integument to look for signs of snake fungal disease. We swap the brown looking scales on this black racer. Also note the cloudy eye scale. This indicates that the snake is getting ready to shed its skin. Here a student holds a smooth earth snake. Here a student holds a black rat snake. This is a black king snake I spotted on the Cresso driveway. If a venomous snake like a copperhead is found, it's temporarily housed until trained Cresso staff can place a pit tag in the snake. To make this project possible, we must find the turtles that we can glue a transmitter to. The masking tape in this photo is temporary and ensures the adhesive will properly bind to the turtle's carapace. While the adhesive is drying, we try to make the turtles as comfortable as possible. 
Here we provided low levels of water for cloacal sucking. To perform radio telemetry, students carry an antenna and a receiver box. This is the tracking receiver. We adjust the frequency it detects for each turtle we're searching for based on their specific transmitter. We use the gain and the tune dials to make our signal audible. As the signal increases to an intensity of 10 milliamps, we turn on the attenuator, which lets us hone in onto our animal. When a turtle is found, we record GPS and environmental data. Sometimes the turtles are found on dry forest floors, and sometimes they're found on the muddy water's edge of a wetland. We don't always get a full visual on our turtles. The attenuator will indicate that we're extremely close, but the vegetation can be very dense and impossible to see through. When a turtle is particularly difficult to find, we actually drive around looking for a signal. I'd like to introduce you all to Emma Watson the box turtle. She is certainly as charismatic and as energetic as they come in East Tennessee. Emma's high activity level makes her a wildly entertaining turtle to track. Go Emma, go! This is Emma Watson and she is climbing up a giant ridge. As we've been tracking Emma all summer, we found her almost exclusively at locations on this ridge. This is Emma, after she made it to the top of the ridge. She's got no problem with being out and moving in front of her. Emma's on the run. As always. Bye. She's going to see Kelsey. They've been friends for years. Are you ready for GPS? Um... She knows me. Was Friday the 15th? Yes. We did a bad job taking data that day. Don't see it on the video. We did a great job. Everybody. Cressida does a great job 150% of the time. Perfect. As you can yeah. see, this wild animal is approaching Kelsey. <laughs> if we happen to have extra time in the field, we can go through demos, like how to draw blood from the subcarapacial sinus. This is the Raptor Center. It houses several residents of various species and requires daily attention from its volunteers for feedings, cage cleanings, and general maintenance. This is the Owl Flight Cage, and at the time of my visit, it was housing two juvenile barred owls. The barred owl cage at the Raptor Center. Oh, there they are. It's a really, really big flight cage. Hello? Hello? How are you? Hello? Hi! Who can blink the most? Go! While none of these owls were injured, they were found as orphans and cared for by the raptor center until they're old enough to hunt on their own. They're housed together versus separately to simulate the nesting environment, which allows individuals to learn from one another. These are the brand new flight cages containing a red-tailed hawk. The best part about the raptor center is not only its mission of saving injured and abandoned wildlife, but how easily it provides a platform for middle school children to work with wildlife and see them every day as they go to school.